Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and we have a really great hangout planned for you today. We're going to continue our celebration of the 25 years of Hubble Space Telescope being in orbit, and we are going to uh, show you our all our our mic what we're calling the microsite, uh, which is sort of the central hub of all things Hubble 25. And we're also going to show you 25 of what we consider to be some of the most representative images of not just the science of Hubble, but also some of the images that illustrate some of the beauty of the universe as well. And so with me to talk about that is, uh, as, as they are with me every week, is Dr. Carol Christian. She's Hello. the uh, outreach scientist. And Scott Lewis, Esquire, the third, no, the third Esquire. <laughs> wow. Dry, it just, no, yeah, I keep, every, I keep every week it keeps going. I love this. <laughs> yeah. I, I Just call me the Lord of the Internet, and that's fine. Uh, no, I'm uh, from KnowTheCosmos.com. I'm from KnowTheCosmos.com. So the, uh, this week's format's a little bit different because uh, it's just going to be the three of us talking about these things. So we really want you, this is your, a great chance for you to ask us questions, leave us comments. Uh, the best way to do that is with the Q&A app on Google Plus or the... Um, uh, the video that you're watching this on, I think it's also on YouTube as well, and you can comment on the YouTube channel that's being broadcast on as long as well as the Google Plus event page. We're looking at all these things. So I'm already seeing Tony Lynch giving us a hi and Michael Jobin giving us a, an exclamation point. So keep them coming, folks, and we'll uh, get to them as we step through the program. So let's get started. So Carol, we are in the process of celebrating the 25 years of the Hubble Space Telescope. When we've, made, yeah. when we've made this thing uh, called the microsite. Let me uh, let me share my screen and put yeah, it let's up. Let's show quick. that. Uh, this, you get to this thing by going to Hubble 25th. Fifth. Fifth. <laughs> That's so strange. 25th. <laughs> yeah, Hubble25th.org. And this is where we are putting everything that we, all of our content will be highlighted here on this spot. So it's it's relatively new. We just went live uh, at the AAS in January. So it's been up about a month and a little bit later, a little bit longer. And as you can see, uh, it's you know it's it's right now. I've got a big banner up here. We've got some things along the side that we're going to get to each one of these. But if you're interested in finding out about news, things that are coming up, this is where you would go. Uh, on March seventh, there's going to be a a, a, a a symphony orchestra concert uh, at in Baltimore. Uh, so all of these things are going to be listed here. Our hangout from today is right up here as well. So you would have learned about our hangout. Uh, from here, if you don't subscribe to our stuff, so these are some of the things. And down at down at the bottom, we have our Flickr stream, and we're gonna I'm gonna come back to this because that's gonna be the highlight of most of what we talk about. And then below that, a little bit about the mission itself, right? The, uh, uh, the just a brief summary of what Hubble is and how it was deployed and when it was launched and all that kind of stuff. And then we have these other things across the top here. Uh, we got one call, we got a tab called Science, and when you click on that. What do you see, Carol? What is this? What is this page designed for? So this page talks about the the basic topics of uh, that Hubble covers, and uh, some people are surprised that we actually do solar system science, but we do. And um, I think everybody knows we do extrasolar planets, and then bread and butter is stars and nebula, galaxies, and then of course the universe. So we we cover all of those topics. Um, from the ultraviolet to the infrared, and this is just to introduce uh, the user to some of the science topics that have been covered, highlights of the science topics that have been covered. Um, and uh, I, I didn't, I knew some of the solar system science, but actually at the AAS we talked through that, and they're, they're really, Hubble has really done some exciting things, which it, it's hard to observe solar system objects with Hubble. It's tricky, but we've done some interesting things. So yeah, it, some it of our biggest hangouts have been yeah. on, these, on these topics, so on too. Those, last, those, yeah. Just last week. Like the ago. Jupiter, yeah. Yeah. So in, and down at the bottom, there are links also. That there's going to be articles as throughout the year as uh, uh, either new press releases come out or, or new stories come out. Uh, so you want to check with these di different sections. If you click on some of these links, like this Comet Ison breakup, uh, will take you to Hubble site. So it'll it's a link that goes to Hubble site, uh, and you can you know read the read about some of the articles that we have there. Um, 
So there's a lot. We're going to try and really be as thorough as we can because there's so much Hubble stuff uh, that you can um, that you can learn about everything going on and what Hubble has done in the various areas. Now, in in the terms of extrasolar planets, though, Carol, this is a pretty new area in which in which Hubble's been contributing, isn't it? It is, and um, it wasn't really foreseen that as much that the Hubble would produce as much as it did. And the interesting thing is that even before Kepler was launched, Hubble had done a transit. Um, it has looked, of course, famously at the debris disks and still looking at debris disks um, from a couple of, you know, famous cases, but also there's a lot more going on getting data from the archive and really picking through it and finding out all the details of debris disks and then trying to understand the relationship between debris disks and planet formation. Um, and then there have been a few uh, studies of a actually atmosphere. So that's a little bit of a preview to what James Webb will be able to do on extrasolar planets and of course is related to things that other orbiting and ground-based telescopes do regarding right. so, extrasolar planets. So Right. So yeah, and so that's just, you know, that so this is where most of the science will be highlighted. That's the science tab so you can check all that out. The images area, um, I, in April we're going to be up, we're going to be unveiling the actual Hubble anniversary image. Now we did unveil an image uh, right. at the AAAS, but that was not the image. And are mm -hmm. these are these past Hubble anniversary images, Carol? Some of them are. Okay. Some of them are. Not all, but some are. Yeah. Okay. So that's where we've gathered a lot of those up. Uh, there's some videos that are being created. Uh, one of our video producers in house every month is going to be producing a Hubble themed video and the first one is already created it's called the beginning uh, and you can watch them here they're also posted on our YouTube page our YouTube channel the next one should be out this month uh, soon um, and uh, so the idea is to uh, is to put them out once per month is it for every month of the year or just leading up to the anniversary Carol, Le remember? leading up to the anniversary and um, I mean she's really uncovered some interesting information but also some interesting people and she found somebody who's very old, but she found him, and he knew Hubble. So, oh, that'll be great. So she did get an interview with him. He's like 95 or something. Anyway, she has interviewed some really interesting people in connection with this. Um, she's done a, a wonderful job on these videos. They're yeah, really, she really, really has. Very They're very awesome. So. And yeah, we're, who we're talking about is Maria Stacion. She also does Behind the Web. That's another video series that she's uh, also doing. So right. that's so look very there nice. to see about the, the, the all the videos will be posted here as well. There's right. an explore section. Um, these are resources, I guess, we got for students and educators. So if you're a teacher right. and you, or just a regular uh, uh, astronomy fan, you can get a lot of information here, uh, information about careers, what it's like, uh, meet some of the people there, some of the discoveries. This is a really cool section here with the the, the different uh, uh, images and facts about Hubble. There's a QA and a that qu questions students have asked over the years. And there's also a, mi a misconceptions section. What's this about, Carol? Do you? Myths versus reality. Right. I mean, there's a lot of things that people, people, like one of the, one of the oh. classic ones is... <laughs> I haven't people, read this page yet. Yeah. The Hubble Space uh, Telescope is a manned satellite with astronauts living in right. research on it as it over. While that might have been a plan a long time ago, no. <laughs> yeah, um, we, I, I still love that concept art that I've seen for it where they did... Yes, show the yes. Well, that was in our, for that. That was in our first amazing. history hangout, remember? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It was uh, amazing. And then other things, like, I mean, the next one is a common thing is that Hubble sees better because it's closer. No, it's by the Earth. It orbits the Earth. And people, and some people think that Hubble, who, and they need, they will learn by asking the question that the universe is very vast and Hubble cannot go to a place and take a picture. So it's in orbit around the Earth um, and it, it, it is controlled from down here and we point it much as we do ground-based telescopes and the reason it sees so clearly is because it's above the atmosphere which causes blurring of images. So there are things like that that, that uh, come up like all the time one. and so they want to... Right. NASA has warp drive technology. What? It doesn't have that? Not right. yet. <laughs> so yeah, Not that's... Yet. A, so I that's, do, but I'm, <laughs> I'm holding up the... Elon Musk and I have been, you know, keeping it under wraps for a while and right. finding out how we're really going to start doing that. 
Yeah, and the final yeah, section yeah. here that I think is among the most important are where you can learn about things that are going on related to Hubble 25 that are not necessarily uh, around Baltimore or done here in our... Um, uh, Sorry, I just got a text. Um, the local universe. The local universe. Yeah, it'll be yes. all over the place. And so, uh, for example, uh, our um, there's there's a talk today in San Jose, uh, California, about Hubble, uh, 25 years of imaging the cosmos, and uh, the um, our hangout is right here also today. So that's also listed. So um, and the hangout from yesterday with I did with Frank uh, about his news from Hubble. So. <laughs> All of the events are are going to be listed here as as they become known. So and I know there are people who have, who have decided to and what, as we talk about the images have decided to use the images and make small presentations locally. And it would be great if they would tell us about that because um, then we could advertise that on on this page and then people who are local to that museum or library or whatever could go there as well. I know there's these pockets of these things going on. Um, that m maybe we don't know about. So. Yeah, now this one looks really cool. If you're going to be in New York on April 30th, uh, Sarah Seeger, Adam Reese, and those guys are going to be giving a talk on Hubble and our altered universe. That looks really good. So anyway, that's the web page. Um, check it out if you want to uh, learn about all things Hubble 25 related. And um, if you have any suggestions or things that you think we should put up, uh, then uh, by all means, uh, let us know, and we can say... Um, we can get, try and get some stuff up there. Okay, so um, I got a quick question here from Sophia Garcia uh, on the Q&A app. Will they still use Hubble when James Webb Space Telescope is launched? These are, for, from, these are from students from Waukegan, Illinois. Yes, so the idea is to have the two telescopes in orbit at the same time, and we do know um, that the James Webb is scheduled to launch in 2018, so about about three and a half years from now, and uh, we know that as long as all the equipment is working on Hubble, that it will last at least until 2020 and then beyond. So it will have at least two years of overlap, and we certainly will keep it operating. As long as all the equipment's working, Hubble will continue to work years thereafter. So they, there may be more than two years. Overlap. Yeah, and that'll be that'll be an ex extraordinary be period exciting. where both yeah. where both us do, where both telescopes are up and operating. Yes. So thank that'll you, students from Waukegan. That was awesome. Um, Ashley N N L is asking, what is the URL of the site you are showing here? It's blurry and I cannot see the URL. The URL is in the description box of the video you're watching, so that's one place you can look, but it's Hubble25TH.org. Hubble25. Yeah, and Michael. <laughs> I've, I've so done it. Hubble. it out. It's in the comments now in YouTube and Google+, so if you guys are watching this anywhere there, um, I've made sure it's in the comments section, too. <laughs> and Michael uh, Jobin says, we should say 25th with raspberry. Michael, yeah, exactly. Hubble 25th. <laughs> there. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, well, now my screen, and now it's all over my yeah, all right. and yeah. Okay. So, all right, let's move to the images themselves. We've, Carol, among others, was in a sort of a committee, I guess, to pick 25 images. Well, Carol, I'll let you decide. I'll let you talk about it. What were you okay. what were thinking here? Yeah, so, tell us what you did, well, Carol. Right. What did so you the, do to us? So the, uh, the idea was that we were, as we were talking about the 25th anniversary, we said, you know, we, we should have, when people say, give us 25 images or what are the best 25, it's hard to choose the best or most significant or whatever. So we decided to just sit down and, and pick 25 images that we thought were um, engaging images but also represented the science being done with Hubble. Some of them are anniversary images, some of them are just popular objects. Um, so we came up with this list, we argued about it a little bit because there were so many, and this well, does argue? not mean that n n any of the other images are not good images. These are just the ones we thought, if you want to make a poster or whatever, that we would concentrate on the descriptions. Um, and in the images area, there is a, a poster that you could print if you wanted to make a display of some or all of these. They're print ready, so you can print them and you could mount them in a school or wherever, library, um, and they're all set and they have captions. So we decided we should do that. We can do that for all the images we've ever released, but we thought we would do 25 for the 25th anniversary. Cool. So that's and what they're about. 
about. Just real quick, I wanted to mention that I forgot at the top of the, the Hangout to mention, we're also looking at the Hubble Hangout hashtag on Twitter, so if you want to comment that way, you can as well. All yeah. right, so Scott, can you... Uh, Scott has, because he is an internet driver extraordinaire, has, has gone yes. through and gathered the images for us so that we can uh, we can share them with you. And yes. he, has, he has organized them in the same way they're done on our Flickr stream. Now, the Flickr stream on Hubble25th.org, let me... I, sh I should probably just show you that real fast. Um, it's right here at the bottom of um, the main page you go to you go down here at the bottom and there is a Flickr stream uh, and you can click on view photo stream and that is what Scott is showing it is in order of on the Flickr stream it's in order of year starting from 1990 to the present um, so um, just so you right. know okay okay so Scott I've got you embiggened on the embiggened. screen so and so what we're looking at here, this is the 1990 image of Supernova 1987A. Yeah, Frank talked about this a little bit at the Hangout yesterday. Carol, do you have any, any, any comments on this one? So 1987A is um, very, very interesting because it has been followed uh, for so long, actually, with Hubble. It's, it's pretty fortuitous that we actually were able to observe it um, for so long. So this image, uh, there, there are many images of it. So this is just one of the ones which is very interesting. But the idea was that as the explosion occurred, there was a light, light, there was a material, but there was also light that came out from, from the supernova. And it ended up um, lighting up this ring and over time different parts of this ring I mean if you, at first glance it always looks like a ring but it has lit up the light has lit up as it hits from the supernova explosion hits different parts of it and ionizes different parts of it and it's very clumpy so over time it's actually changed which is interesting so one, this image is evocative of the whole event but um, the idea is that we've been watching it over a long period of time and the ring was actually a surprise because what it indicates we think of a supernova as being very catastrophic and what was a little bit of a surprise is that that ring was there and so as the light came out um, before the material came out with as the light came out from the explosion, it hit this debris that was already around the star. So the star had already done something, maybe not so catastrophic, but it had gotten rid of some material. So the light came out and illuminated that ring, and then slowly over time, some of that material that came from the central star has come out and started to impinge the ring. So it's, it's very interesting, and it's one of the things there... You know, when I first took astronomy, it was always like, oh, things change over a really long period of time and you'll never see changes. And this is one of the things that actually does change um, quite a lot. So it's, I know, uh, it blows it's, me away that back in the day, we used to think the, the sky was just sort of static and an un, and un, sort of an unchanging place. But, you know, there's actually fields of study that measure transient uh, events like supernovae uh, uh, eruptions or, or uh, you're watching, I think... Uh, uh, you know, different things rotate up in up in the sky. So, uh, or one star passing in front of another star and lensing it a little bit. So there's all these little things. It's a very dynamic place, and uh, this is an example of the kind of things that Hubble has discovered that we didn't expect. It's the it's the kind of thing you get from launching uh, missions like this. You find out all kinds of things you didn't even know or didn't even anticipate. So. Um, we're not going to have time to talk about every single image. Every but, single one, right. But exactly. I did all so, of them very briefly. Yeah. So what do you got next, Scott? I well, have NGC 4621. What is this that? Is from 1991. Okay. Um, well, I, don't, uh, I just want to know what it is. I can't, I can't tell it's what it just is. A, it's a... And the, the other thing is we may want to skip ahead a little bit because okay. this... this the. The thing is that these images are from the early days before the telescope was picked. Okay. Right. So, okay. um, all right. So this, was, this, was, this was an example of an image before the uh, the spherical aberration was corrected. Okay. So right. And so this one. is this one's um, just to give some context about what this image is. It's um, we're we're discovering disk fueling a possible black hole. So it's very early sure. days of Hubble sure. and. Yes. 
And yeah, so some things are looking a little fuzzy, and we'll see actually in a couple images the the big difference what happened when we were able to fix. Yeah, it. let's go to that. Well, let's go. Let's go to the next one, and then we'll go to the one you're talking. That's just a real pretty picture there. That's this really... is, yeah, this is Orion. Who yes. does? I've got a better one lined up later on in the show. Yeah, this is the yeah. Still fire. In fact, right after this, we should we should um, look at the Orion because the Orion. So this was one of the first images of the Orion Nebula. Prior to the repair, right? Yes, which is the, which year is the... Um, 92. 92, 92 so 92, yeah, yeah, anything before 95 is... Yeah, so um, so this is early, but actually I, I think it would be a good idea to, to show if you have... Um, one of the mosaics of the Orion that would be that would be amazing. Do you have? Yes, we, you do we have. We do have that. It's, 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 um, so it's sort of a before and after thing. You mean? Yeah, this is yeah. So in okay. 2006, uh, let me. May, yeah, let me maybe. Pull that up. There we go. Is that showing on the Hangout? Yeah. yeah. So That's... this is a, a large image of Orion. Um, and it shows uh, a very large region, and this is actually uh, th this nebula. Although you you're not going to just look up and see it and see it like this. It is a fuzzy spot if you have if you're in a really dark place. Um, it's part of the nebula region in Orion near the belt and the sword, and that whole region has all kinds of star formation and really interesting. Uh, things, but Orion, the Orion Nebula is very famous because it has a lot of structure in it, and there's also um, and you can see a 3D fly-through of it um, yeah. that that was produced. Yes. Okay. So Scott, while you do the before and after thing, I want to get to a uh, a quick uh, question on YouTube. This was from uh, Sergio Montalar Montefar. Sorry if I'm messing up your names, guys. Uh, is the Hu Hubble data uh, only available in the Legacy Archive, or is it available in other in other sites? Where can I download planetary data? Thank you. No, it's not only available in the Legacy Archive. There's also the Mikulski Archive for Space Telescopes uh, called MAST, which you can do science queries against and get planetary data that way. Uh, is there anything else, Carol? Um, well, well, okay, the Hubble Legacy Archive is an interface into the archive. You can also go to what's called the portal. So if you go to archive.stsci.edu, that's a different interface. Oh, okay. So um, the planetary data uh, should be available through the main archive page. Uh, I believe, but I haven't actually tried to search on yeah, okay, on, so, on yeah. that. But there's a main archive page, which is where the science data is, and the Hubble Legacy Archive includes that data, but also then um, a lot of process data as well. Right. So archive.stsci.edu, and you can also check um, uh, later. There's going there's, to there's be a revamped um, uh, interface for that as well, which we're going to have a hangout on a little bit later once once it gets released. So thank you for the question, Sergio. Okay, so uh, as we move along, I'd actually I'd like to actually pick some images. Yes, go right ahead. Um, that and so I'm going <laughs> to kind of. Throw You're going this off little... script, aren't you, Carol? Yeah, she's she's going rogue. Going well, rogue. Be, be, before well, you go, I, before okay, you go rogue, is, can I? Okay, this is a particular. Yeah, sure. This is just a particular list that the list that's actually on the website is different than this, and so um, I, I want to make sure that we cover some of the the images that we that we put on this website that have prepared posters. Okay. Um, but anyway, go ahead. So Picks. what I wanted to show here, this is actually from 1994, and what's on the Flickr stream is I thought wasn't really indicative of what we're trying to show, but I pulled this up from our press archive. And this is when we're seeing things change. So this is of M100, the galactic nucleus there. And so you can see here on the left what we were seeing beforehand. And then when we were, when we were able to put up the wide field planetary camera 2, we see a huge upgrade in what we're able to see. And this, this here, I think, really shows on that we, over 25 years, and this is early on, that we've been able to go up to Hubble and and upgrade it and be able to expand what it was originally meant to do, as you know, we'll see later on with frontier fields and things like that. But we've been able to continually improve ourselves in using this.
fantastic tool we have in low-Earth orbit to to get better resolution and to look further back in time and space with, with Hubble. And so I think this is a really great image that shows that though we might have had some speed bumps in the beginning, we've been able to go up, fix those, and improve them beyond what we were intending to do in the first place. Okay, so... Um... Yeah, I mean, that's... Okay, so that's kind of the turning point at which now the telescope has been... Um, really improved. So uh, w one of the ones, another one that I wanted to, before, I, I don't want to go out into the, uni the universe yet, yet, so we've looked at the Orion Nebula. Um, there's one that uh, I, I think is, is very interesting, which is the Horsehead Nebula. Um, I'm actually putting that up on my screen, so I guess I can try to I'll screen share Okay, this. well, while you're screen sharing, I'm going to read a, a quick question uh, from Pauline Acklin from the uh, Q&A app. Um, she's asking, I've always been curious as to how one is able to rent time using Hubble. What are the qualifications? Does a certain type of research take precedence over another, or is it more independent on who is doing the research? I imagine there's quite a wait list. So the answer to that question is, we, the, the, the short answer is, we've done a Hangout on this very topic. It's, uh, so do a search on our playlist for Hubble Hangouts, and it's called How to Use Hubble. Okay, And we've talked about this exact thing in great detail. But the slightly sh longer, but not as long as the Hangout answer is, we have a committee, a time allocation committee, where proposals are sent and they are um, they are uh, looked at over the uh, course of uh, oh did we lose Carol and they are looked at over uh, based on a lot of like criteria mostly their science impact <laughs> yeah you, you lost me for a second too uh, the yeah, I, my, my app crash oh it did we're back yeah. Boy, okay. we have an well, I'm glad I'm still here. So, um, anyway, that's a good question, and it's a very, it's a very, it is a, it is a very um, scientifically fair process. I think, I think, it, but, but it, you're right, it is very competitive. They get way more proposals than they ever have time for. Okay, do you have another? Uh, what happened? Well, I, I, I'm having an infrastructure problem. I thought that I clicked on screen share, but it's not. Okay, can you, you wanted the tell, horse head, right? You just tell, I wanted uh, the horse head nebula. The new um, one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's from 2013. Okay. Yes, this is one of my favorite images. Go ahead, Carol. So this image, <laughs> this was interesting because we had done several images of the horse head in the past. And... Uh, the, so it's a uh, the Hubble is a really tiny part of the horse head, just right at the top. And then there's a beautiful ground-based telescope. Well, many amateurs have taken beautiful images too. So it was kind of fun because a lot of people contributed their their images of the horse head as well. So it's a very famous amateur um, object, and it's also part in a, a very large extension of where the Orion Nebula is as well. So anyway, uh, we decided that we had done the, the horse head in the visible before, and then we decided to try to do it in the infrared, and the team actually had a long, spanning many meetings, like over s several weeks, of whether we were going to do the infrared or we were going to do the ultraviolet or what, what we were going to do. And in the end, we decided to do the infrared image. And it's so stunning that if you bring it up on your screen, the full image, it, it looks 3D. I mean, when you look at it, it's just amazing yeah. because you can see there's so you can see right through it, you can see stars, you can see the structure. And then our animators made a 3D. A 3D oh, uh, slide towards it, and it's re it's a really nice image. It's just a stunning image. That's one that you want to print and put on your wall. So that's yes, very good that's one. That's very cool. So okay. that's star formation. Right. So you got so, another one for us? So there's another one which is um, I think is on on your list, uh, which is 5189, which was a two, 2012 image. Um, and, yes. and so, so the horse head uh, is a star formation. Orion is star formation. This is what happens when a star like our sun gives off its atmosphere. Now, in this case, the star like our sun does not completely explode. Um, it gives off 
uh, part of its atmosphere. And the interesting thing is that early on it was thought that a star would do this once, but it turns out it, it does it more than once. And originally they thought we thought um, that it would it would just be kind of evil, either sort of elliptical in shape or spherical. Well, <laughs> that's not yeah, what this is. <laughs> this is a pretty interesting image because it's it's completely unexpected. So it it kind of look, looks like you know when you go out in your garden and you turn on your garden hose and you forgot to you know clamp it down and it just goes all over the place so it sort of looks like from the center that there's some kind of jets and and something that has like spewed off material in rings and in loops and in spirals and then as that is all illuminated um, it ionizes different uh, chemical elements and that that's what gives it the color but it's it's such a complicated structure, you can imagine. I mean, this is very hard to model. Yeah, yeah. And, and then as you, as you look at it in more and more detail, you see, you know, it's not just, it's not smooth at all. It's got all these nodules, yeah. and it streams outward, and it's just, it's weird. It's very complicated. Really weird. Very complicated. But that's what can happen to a star. If it has, it probably has magnetic fields, it's probably rotating. And as it loses it, the the atmosphere, this is what happens, and then it ionizes. There's a, there's a white dwarf in there somewhere, isn't there? Somewhere in there, there's a white dwarf. So this is how stars like the sun will 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 die. Very beautiful, and we won't want to be around. I want to get a yeah. quick uh, qu a question in from Brad M. How long is it estimated will Hubble be able to be upgraded before it becomes obsolete? Hubble has gotten its last upgrade. Yeah. It won't be getting upgraded anymore. That happened back in 2009. Uh, as far as becoming obsolete, uh, I don't think that's possible. I think it'll always be usable as long as it stays up there. Now, if yeah. we do nothing to it, then the um, then the uh, its orbit will begin to go down. And around 2025, uh, things will start. We'll have to start thinking about what we're going. You know how what we're going to do with Hubble at that point. But that's a long way off. And right now, Hubble's in great shape, taking great data. And like we said earlier, we want to be able to use it at the same time as JWST. So. Uh, we, uh, hopefully, Hubble will still be around for a very long time. Okay. So there are there are two two more images that I really want to show. Uh, well, there are several, but um, there there is one there's one that's called NGC 6302, and the other one is the Crab Nebula. So while I guess while we're talking about stars that explode, the image of the Crab Nebula would be fantastic yes, to that, take a look at. That represents an explosion that happened in 1054? Yes. Of a star? So that explosion was actually visible um, by people who knew the sky very well. And so, um, you know, it exploded and then nobody knew what it was until there were telescopes. And then the first telescopes began to understand that there was a nebula there. And then the observation with Hubble really demonstrated um, in detail. So Scott, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah, I'm sure you, you heard. You, you, you having trouble finding it? No, oh, I, there, there it is. No, there, there it is. is. OK. That's Very great. Cool. Yeah, so this this image is quite amazing. Um, and an we explosion. were talking about, yeah, in, in the last case of the planetary nebula, in contrast, um, that one's pretty complicated, but this one's really complicated. And the right. reason that it has this really tortured structure, um, it, I don't know, it kind of looks like taffy that exploded or something. I don't know what, <laughs> but um, it, it, it is magnetic fields that causes that ionized material to make that web-like structure. And so, you know, some of it's compressed, some of it's... Uh, spread out, and so in the explosion, these magnetic fields come out, and they get all twisted up, and they trap the material, and then um, the as the explosion then uh, produces a lot of light, and that causes the material to glow again um, because it's ionized material and the different colors of the different the different elements. But this is the kind of thing, like supernova explosions are interesting and studied because this is where the heavy elements, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, but all, all the other elements like Everything. silicon, plutonium, all that, the iron, star stuff. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Star, star stuff. So when, 
And so they make that in their interiors, and then when these stars blow up, they spew that stuff back out into space. And as this nebula expands into material nearby, that stuff is compressed, and then you start getting new stars. Right. This is the crucible of all that make us up. It's where it comes from. It's right there. Right. Um, okay, so, so go ahead. Well, I was just going to say the next one we ought to look at, since we were talking about that, is... Uh, NGC 3603. Okay, while Scott pulls that up, I'm going to get to a quick question that I, I wouldn't, I like the answer to this too. And I, I, will there be a chance? This is from Cesar E from the Q and A. Will there be a chance that Hubble makes pictures of the remains of Eagle, the Eagle Lander, the Moon Rover, etc., on the surface of the Moon? Carol, do we ever have any plans to um, look at the Moon with Hubble to see those things? No, the moon is too bright to do that, but there has been um, observation. And remember, Hubble is a science instrument. There have been flybys and other telescopes that have already imaged those things. Um, the, you know, there, there's a lunar recon reconnaissance um, orbiter and things like that. I mean, those LRO takes pictures of the surface all over the place. So oh, yeah. LRO there are great. satellites there that are taking much better resolution. Um, there were some observations of the moon near the Terminator to sit, look for the possibility of uh, evidence of water, which was not found. But um, that's one observation. And then Mars, we've mostly done... Um, We've done uh, looking for at the weather, but we can't actually resolve uh, the the actual landers. But the there are orbiters around Mars, like we have Landsat and GOI and stuff like that that go around our own planet. We have we have satellites that go around Mars that have great resolution yeah. for finding that stuff, and they have found. Uh oh, hello. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, the I landers see. and bounce around in their pillows, and those have been found and all that. So those images are quite spectacular. But no, we're we're mainly a, we do science and okay. science studies only. We don't do. Yeah, that's a common question. Good NASA. one, Cesar. Thank you for for asking that. Um, Scott, how are we doing on the? Are you able to find what she was asking for? Oh, it's just thirty six oh three. Okay, yep. uh, let me pull it up here. Yeah. Now, the, so what we were talking about before when we talked about the Crab Nebula, so we've seen star formation regions, and we saw nebula like the sun blow up, and we have also seen, um, or they pu are puff, more puff balls, but quite dynamic, and then Crab Nebula, so we have supernova that blow up, and you, and in this, in this case, this is the material, so there was a material that came from those early stars that blew up, and all that stuff mixed together, and it collapsed, and it made this star cluster, and so this star cluster, it's a, a bunch of stars that have formed together, um, I just think it's quite beautiful. There's hundreds of stars that have formed together and it is emerging from the material out of which it was born. So in Orion we can't see these star clusters yet because they're still embedded. Uh, but here's a case where there's a nebula where it is old enough that the, the ionizing radiation from the stars in the cluster has pushed that material away and you can you can see that it's it's sculpted things away and it's pushing it out and pushing material in, into, you know, some material into the material that was already there. So I think the emerging clusters are really of interest to me, and I really like this cluster. They're it's also among the most quite... beautiful images, too, that Hubble's ever taken, I think. This is amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, to illustrate a, a similar point, another, um, another cluster that we looked at was the Tarantula Nebula. Okay. Um, the tarantula well, is in it. Go ahead. Did you have a question? Are you pulling that up, Scott? I was uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go. Go ahead. Well, well, let's wait till he gets it up before you talk about it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I just then, wondered if you had a question. But the reason I say that it's a good opportunity for you to get to. We've got a lot of questions. You guys are really doing great. Thank you so much for sending all okay, these. Okay. Yeah. Let's have another question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Tony Lynch is asking. This might sound like a wacky idea. Would it have been possible or even feasible to lower the HST's orbit and attach it to the ISS? 
it's a good idea. And when John Grunsfeld left on the last serving scene mission, when he left uh, Hubble in orbit, he attached a black ring around the bottom of the telescope. But if you look at the, some of the pictures of the Hubble in space, you can see it there. So in theory, it's possible to send up maybe a SpaceX robotic uh, satellite or something that can grab it and pull it down. Um, but we do not want to do that because the ISS is a really crappy environment. <laughs> That's what I was getting to. Why would we want to? <laughs> we don't want to do that. I, under, you know, I understand. Yeah, you could have it right next door, and you could change the instrumentation. But then you, but then you really compromise the integrity of, first of all, the the cleanliness of the instrumentation. So there's contamination from the ISS, and secondly, you can get stuff on the mirror, and so it's much better to have Hubble isolated. Um, away from a the atmosphere, so that's why it's so high because there is still a little bit of atmosphere up there, and we don't want it in a dirty environment. And there have been many cases. There have been several proposals of putting demonstrator telescopes tethered to the ISS, but it is well understood by the astronomical community that if you put a facility up there, it will be very dirty. Right. That and it will not have beautiful image quality, and you will compromise your instruments over some period of time. But I think the spirit of the question was, could we maybe do that, bring it down to ISS, repair it, and then move it back up again? But that would be... Oh, that, no. That and the reason you... Can, you know, that's a lot of work, and, and it can't be moved, because yes. the solar... The solar um, you know, the, the, the solar panels are deployed, and there's no way to fold them up. You can't, right. And you can't fold the antenna and all that. It went up in the shuttle. That was the perfect transport mechanism. But once deployed, it was meant to be deployed. You can't fold it all up, and you'll yeah, damage it, it and get it dirty <laughs> and all that stuff. So, yeah, interesting uh, idea. Yeah, yeah. G g interesting idea, though. Okay, Scott, do you have it up here? I do. Okay. So the, do, the tarantula is is interesting because, so thinking about 30, 3603, which was we saw one cluster, this is a case where it looks like there's an emerging star cluster kind of on the leftish side, but it, it does appear that in the detailed studies that that star cluster then spawn. notice that there's one um, on the left but up near the top, that these clusters are forming all over this region, but the presence of one cluster is is illuminating and pushing the material out of which it was born causing it to run into other material, and then another cluster is formed. And so it's believed, uh, people who are studying this very carefully, are looking at how many generations of star clusters are in this, um, in this region. And so it's pretty interesting because we don't have another good example. This is um, uh, in a companion galaxy, one of the Me Magellanic Clouds, and uh, because it's far enough away, we can see the whole region and we can see these multiple generations of star clusters. And this is not just one Hubble image. This is a Hubble mosaic. So it's like right. using panorama or whatever yeah, and, and and the, with the, your the, cell phone. So, right, that, so that's biggest, how we do it. And the biggest example of that we have are, is, the, is the Andromeda image that was released in January called the FAT image. And that was a 300 megapixel mosaic of all kinds of Hubble pointings. And so that's another right, and the really M31. great image that went in there. Okay, I, I have a request now. I want to see a deep field. Would you would you find the uh, uh, the latest uh, deep field? Are you so impatient? We're so impatient. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> We're really out of time. And we have so many going questions. off script, but you're like, give it to me now. Like, well, I like, want to no, talk. No, no, that's fine. We don't have we time. We the Hubble deep field. All right. We, we'll do we it in the deep field. Okay, so <laughs> here's a question from Julian O. Moonspell from YouTube. When Hubble Space Telescope takes an image, let's say the Orion Nebula, does it give a color image or do you have to process it and assign colors? What is the convention for this? Uh, basically, it does not take color images. What, we, what you see when we get back from Hubble are a bunch of grayscale images, all taken with different filters of different red uh, wavelengths, and then they're assembled. Uh, according to those wavelengths, they're assigned a color table, and that's where the color comes from. That's a very short answer to your question, but the, the, I wanted to give you the convention is basically Hubble has many, many filters, and when it takes image, an image in that filter, all it's got is a file with pixels and, and numbers in it, and those numbers represent uh, how much of that light, how many photons there were, and so it, and it'll be different in red, 
as it would be in blue or green. And Hubble has, gosh, I don't know how many filters does it have, uh, Carol? I don't know. It's got that's a hundred filters. And there, there's a bunch. Because red, each red. instrument has several filters. But an interesting note on that, though, is Hubble is the only space telescope that has filters in the ultraviolet. So if you want anything in the ultraviolet, which is important for star formation studies and things like that, Hubble is the only game in town. Um, so I wanted to comment that while this beautiful picture um, it, it gives you an impression of the astrophysics happening here, in order to actually understand it, we need those um, those filtered images. We need to look at the, the and measure because we can't measure this. This doesn't tell you how much is emitting in oxygen and carbon and nitrogen. Um, and we also need to measure the, the stars at different band passes, at different energies, to understand how old they are, how big they are, all that. So we need the individual filters so that we can understand in detail how the stars, what they're made of, and how old they are, and for the nebula, exactly what the the chemical composition is of the nebula. So where is the oxygen relative to the nitrogen? So you need to use a nitrogen filter and just look at the nitrogen, using an oxygen filter just to look at the oxygen, and then you can understand the relative um, relationship of those different components in these nebulas. So that's yeah, why we really take good. the different. We make the pretty pictures because they're pretty and they're interesting and they inform the science, but that's not what, they're not the heart of, of what scientists measure. Okay, here it is, folks. Actually, here that's it, not it. I, oh, I lied to you. Oh, that's you an old me. one. You tease me. So that's so, an old one. Okay. There's so, so many ultra deep fields. I know. So Let's pull this up. Yeah. The one I, from. The, my favorite is still the first one, the one from 1995. But, uh, it could be, while you're, but the, another the question one, then while we're waiting. Would you ever consider attaching propulsion to Hubble to send it further out into the solar system to possibly get better images as it moves out or gets newer viewpoints or possibly to other outer solar system to better see what is in dark areas of? Um, would I consider it? Sure. <laughs> Will I ever? Is it, is it practical? I don't think so. Uh, I think where, leaving Hubble where it is is probably the best, the best way to go there for that. Any, any comments right. on that? Well, Okay, Hubble was not built for that. When if you're going right. to do that kind of thing, you have to think about how your antennas are going to work, how strong the antennas are going to be, whether they have sufficient power to do that, um, whether you can control it. You have to send signals, and the further out you go, the more time lag there is when you're when you're pointing the telescope. So uh, there are a lot of considerations, and so that's why the telescopes that go out into the solar system are very specialized. They have specific equipment to do the job they're supposed to do, and they have transmitters and an antennas to receive commands and transmitters to transmit back information um, that are specific to that, and Hubble was never built for that. So we first, and the other thing is, although Hubble has been boosted slightly, its solar panels are so fragile that you can't just be moving it around. So the process of moving Hubble is a very delicate thing, and the and the astronauts have done that. They've done it. They've boosted with the shuttle. They've moved it out slightly, but it's a you know this stuff is very delicate, precise, and you can really mess things up by putting a propulsion system on. It. Yeah, that's a so way it was better never answer. Built for that. That's that's, that's never a way, built way better. For that. Yeah, that's a way better answer than the one I was going to, my, my, my flip answer that, sh that I gave you. So thank you, Carol. Okay, Scott, thank you for there putting you this up. Here it is, folks. This is my favorite image ever. Uh, this, you got, the, the image itself, while it's pretty and there's a bunch of smudges and smears everywhere, the thing about this image that gets me every time is how it was taken and what it represents. This was taken in an area of sky where there, we didn't know that anything was there. It was a dark area. There were no stars in our galaxy. There were no other galaxies we knew of in the way. This was a black patch of sky where nothing was ever thought to be. And when they exposed the uh, telescope, they saw a frame filled with galaxies. There's 11,000 galaxies or so in here. And we've re re we've revisited this sky many, many, this, this place many, many times. Most recently, last year, I think, where we looked at it in the ultraviolet, and we added ultraviolet wavelengths, and we saw a few more galaxies and things like that. And I just, this to me, 
is still the most important image ever taken. And um, I don't know, Carol, do you want to add some actual science comments to that instead of a bunch of <laughs> <laughs> bunch of fluff that I just did? Okay, so the reason that the, the, the importance of doing deep, deep fields, um, first of all, you will, of course, want to push as deep as you can back further and further in time. And the idea is, one of the ideas is, ca can you see, can you see galaxies forming way back, so number one, so can you count them and measure them? So that's the first task, and you need multiple filters to do that um, because we cannot use spectroscopy to determine that. The, the faintest objects here cannot be reached um, using spectroscopy, so we need to take images and filters to, to guess at their distances. The other question is, so there's the distribution in space going outwards from the Earth, and the other the question that one wants to ask is, you see morphologies of, you know, the spirals, ellipticals of, of nearby galaxies, is the same thing happening, how far back is the same thing happening, and what, what, how were galaxies first formed? Were they small little pieces that ran into together, or are large galaxies formed as large galaxies? Did they start out as large galaxies and they're always like that, or what? And it turns out it's likely that galaxies actually form from small bits and pieces, although curiously enough, there are some, when you look back in time um, to the early universe, there are some very massive galaxies even back then. So there, there may have been pockets of material that formed very large galaxies and in other places little ones that later merge. Um, and so. let me just remind you guys that uh, we did a hangout with uh, Massimo Stiavelli a couple of weeks ago where we talked about the earliest galaxies and their first stars. So he gave us a lot of good information on that as well. Uh, Judy Schmidt. Hi, Judy. Um, the solar panels are not attached very strongly to the telescope? Question mark. Apparently they are. They, they are robustly attached to the telescope, but they are large extended pieces of mylar. Right. So take a so, huge piece of mylar and you know leave it out in space and it's going to flop as it as a telescope. I mean, there's a little bit of atmosphere up there and so it is going to be affected by that. And so they do they move and in fact they were replaced by smaller solar panels because the large ones had some problems. So solar panels are uh, an interesting technology, and if you're going to have the stretched out lightweight so you can launch it, um, yeah, they're robustly attached to the telescope, but you can't be just shoving them around in space. Oh, yeah, um, especially you, they're very delicate. They're built for being in low Earth orbit and maintaining that, so if you're attaching it to another spacecraft and putting that sort of force onto yeah, it by, by just, yeah. just the acceleration, it's not, right. it wasn't built to be on it there. So it wasn't it's, built to do from that. From an engineering point of view, it's right. not it's, meant to be receiving that force. Right. <laughs> it's not a Jeep. Uh -huh. It's not a Jeep. So <laughs> I do, I am compelled to show, because oh. we, you know, preempted my story, I would like to show the Galaxy M83, okay. um, which is in, um, and there's a point there. Okay, two more things I want to show. One is M83. You, you know we have email before the show, right? I'm just making sure. We'll we'll, we'll 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 talk about this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So while we while we get our our ducks in a row there, uh, Tiberius Maximus. <laughs> That's a great. Yeah. Idea. Right. Uh, what amazing breakthrough is it that astro it makes astronomers most excited? For 2015, I don't know, Carol. Are you looking forward to anything this year? Me, it's Frontier Fields. I like all. The, I like watching yeah. all. Yeah, Frontier, Frontier, Frontier Fields. I think um, Frontier Fields. But you know, I, I don't. I don't like choosing the best. Uh, <laughs> there are all. Well, all could you these... choose me all the time? I mean, uh, yeah. oh yeah, so, we'd all uh, we'd all just choose. Let's not go there. But um, you know, everyone, you know, exoplanets, planets, there's all kinds of things going on that is research, and all of it's spectacular. Yeah, and exoplanets so stuff I can is choose the too. best, because I, I believe that all these lines of investigation, and they're all also connected. So, 
So, and I, uh, and I want to try to sell that story to you because we have talked about the Orion Nebula, we've talked about supernova exploding and pushing um, material at, into other materials forming star, uh, star clusters like 30, 3603 and the Tarantula Nebula, and here's a galaxy that we're looking at, and this kind of thing is going on all over this galaxy. I mean, right. there's all kinds of star formation regions, there's one cluster, you know, you can see over kind of in the mid-left, there's a, a bubble, a cluster with a bubble, exactly that's what's happening, only it's a, a distant galaxy. And so that star cluster is pushing its material out, it's running into that other material, and there's going to be new star clusters forming. And so it was, you know, the whole part of the story, and this is considered, even though this galaxy is pretty far away, um, it, it, in the cosmic scale, this is a quote, quote, a nearby galaxy, and we can see the star clusters, and we can count them, um, and we can see how they're related to the overall spiral structure. And so the next step of the story was, well, although there's an inter intermediate step, because I want to ask you to show another another image. Um, the question about the HDF is, okay, we see these spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies, is that what's going on in the distant universe? And that was the point of doing the Hubble deep fields, is to find out if galaxies like we see today are forming in the early universe. And it looks like uh, pretty far back they are. But then at some point, um, this grand design type of formation was not happening and it probably was built up from little tiny pieces. So the, the last one, which you have on your list, is um, ARP-273. All right, let me pull it up. And, and this is another piece of the puzzle. So this, there's three, actually three galaxies here. There's, there's the large spiral galaxy you see, there's one below, and then up, up on the right coordinate, there's another galaxy. And so part of the clue of this happening with the star formation being triggered all over uh, a galaxy is that there's a lot, there are many galaxies that interact and produce these spiral patterns and produce all this star formation and it's a lucky thing because we wouldn't be here without supernova and star formation and exoplanets and all that. So it, it is a, th a thread and that's why it's hard for me to choose one thing because these things are all related and right. we need to understand every piece of this to actually understand the whole universe that we're in. Very good. Okay. Ta -da! So you got them through. All right, we've got three minutes and a bunch of questions. I'm oh my get God! Through. All right. I want to give one to Luca Skywalker from YouTube. I have a question because it is quite confusing. With naked eyes we cannot see a real nebula how it looks, right? Uh, we need the same filter that Hubble that the Hubble telescope has, but actually, how it looks like out there without. So, what does it look like without any filters? Are there any real uh, images? In other words, what's the how do? I guess I think the spirit of this question is we're kind of uh, not looking at the thing like it really is. If we looked up at the sky with our own eyes. They tried to see this nebula. That's that, a, that the, yeah, Hubble that's a question at. that's always asked. And amateurs, yeah. amateurs take pictures all the time without oh, yeah. filters. Especially like the but, Orion is a perfect example of Right. That. That's an example, but it isn't as rich because you don't get your eye cannot respond to all of the wavelengths and it cannot discriminate between the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen, or what the colors of the stars are. So um, for science, we do we take images in different colors, not for the glory of making pretty pictures, but to do science. And we need the filters to do robust science. Um, and so we make the 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 color images to demonstrate the astrophysics, but the real measurements come from the individual frame. So if you just go out in space, you will not see the same dynamic range. Things right. will just look kind of gray. They usually are not very, when you look up at the night sky, there are a couple stars that you can see that have color, like Rigel and Betelgeuse, and you can tell that if you, you're careful, you can tell that Mars is reddish. But we don't have the same discrimination and dynamic range in our eyes. And so if we just showed you the com composite images, you'd go, huh, okay, kind of interesting. But even Hubble has much more dynamic range and 
um, both wavelength coverage and dynamic range. So it doesn't really represent what the eye would see. It's much richer than that because that's what we need for the science. Okay. Well, I guess we will we will leave it there. Thank you, Carol, and thank you for that question. That was a good one. And gosh, you guys, this has been a fun hangout. I, you guys yeah. were really active. Thank you for leaving us questions and comments, and I tried to get to as many as I could. So yeah. I'm sorry if I didn't get to all of them, but we, 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 we've run out of time. Before I, I sign make, off... Huh? I do want to make one um, note here just from Twitter. Um, oh, Monique Jacob ahead. just says, like, every time I think Hubble can't impress me any further, they release another <laughs> stunning picture that makes me speechless. <laughs> I... And, that's great. I, I agree. I, I, yeah. Even being um, someone on the inside, the same thing goes. Whenever I see something new that's coming out, like, what? How? Okay. Yeah. I like. I get to be excited all the time about the the new things that were going on. When, you know, the ultra deep field uh, with UV, that that the Andromeda one, or oh, the smiley face. I thought that was an amazing, <laughs> amazing. Yeah, that image. was a very popular image. That was very and popular. It, it, it got a lot. Of, it got a lot yeah. of um, great. You know, it got a lot of people talking about it. And understanding <laughs> what yeah. an Einstein ring is and how, it, and it really digs into things like frontier fields and understanding gravitational lensing. And so, I think it's great that not only is it beautiful, but we can learn so much from it uh, yeah. in the same process. Absolutely. It's much more to come. So on that very positive note, we're going to close our hangout. I want to remind everybody there is a an Ode to Hubble video contest going yeah. on right now at ESA at ESAspaceTelescope.org. I have the link also in the description box, so go and check it out and leave a video. Make a video about t telling us some of these things like what, uh, what Scott just read from Twitter. So we'd like to see your video, so don't forget yeah. to do that. Next week's Hangout on Thursday at 3 o'clock, we're going to be looking at the granddaddy of all debris disks, Beta <laughs> Pictoris. And yeah, we've got, lot, we've, got a, we've got a lot of it. We've got a press release coming out on Thursday about this. We'll have the principal investigators uh, announcing some new research from Hubble on all you wanted to know about debris disks. So we hope <laughs> we'll see you there. Uh, thank you all for watching. This has been one of the funnest ones we've ever done. Thank you all so much. And on behalf of Carolyn Scott, keep looking up. Looking up. Thank you. <laughs>